Well, welcome everyone to a seat at the table and I'm so excited to have a friend but also someone very inspiring and um, someone I really look up to in the space, Lauren Fong with us today. She is a principal at ISAS Ventures and also the manager of Archangels. So today we're really unpacking uh, women-led founders in that world and uh, just Lauren's seat at the table. So thank you, Lauren, for being on the podcast today. Thank you so much. Thanks, Briar. Uh, thank you, Mel, for having me today. It's an absolute pleasure. And yeah, let's get into it. Let's do it, eh? Exciting. Should we do some quick fire? Yes. Quick I'm fire questions. It. Get it going. Going. Okay, Lauren, what is your ideal holiday? I love to go somewhere where there's amazing waves. I love to surf um, or an amazing uh, spot for scuba diving. Somewhere like Mexico or Indonesia. Ooh. The ocean. Yeah. The ocean's your, your bag. Ocean centric. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Party with 100 or five? people. Can I say 500? No! <laughs> yes, you can. You go, girl. When are you most relaxed? I'm most relaxed when I'm lying on my surfboard, uh, you know, doing a sunset surf somewhere beautiful up north like Mangafai, um, and just enjoying the warm water in between waves. Yeah. So cool. Awesome. Were you born with your strengths or did you develop them? I definitely developed them. Mm. Um, yeah, that's. I think I was born with some foundational uh, qualities or traits in me that later on became strengths. Mm. Yeah. Can I ask a backup question to the quick fire? Go for it. <laughs> how did you develop them? What made you develop them and how did you develop them? There were certain life experiences. Um, some of them were good, some of them were bad at the time. You know, they, were, they tested me and they tested my boundaries. And so um, I like to see myself as a pretty ambitious um, go-getter, um, you know, sort of free of inhibitions kind of person and those life experiences shaped me and you know allowed me to be the person I am today mm. always find that super interesting mm. I'd love to dig into that a lot a lot more but mm. um this is quick fire so <laughs> do you have a hype ritual and if so what is what is it definitely this is actually something I do every morning um doesn't matter if it's before work or before just starting the day but basically I just blast um like electronic music uh, mm-hmm. um if I'm kind to my flatmates and I'll do it through my earpods if it's um <laughs> I'm, I'm alone at home it's just on my big speakers on the bass yeah mm. love it yeah. good beats yeah. that's what I do love it um and if you could invite one person to dinner tonight dead or alive who would it be so that would be Damien Lillard. He is uh, my favourite NBA player. He plays for the Trailblazers, the Portland Trailblazers. Um, they're my favourite NBA team. Uh, I love him not only because he's one of the greatest uh, shooters in the league, but uh, he's an incredible leader to um, kind of everyone in the NBA. And uh, kind of like me, he's got his main thing, which is basketball, and then he also is a an, an artist on the side. He's a rapper. And so I just love to get to know like how he balances being you know, the pressure of being an incredible basketball player, but then also releases songs and raps and he's a hip hop musician. So it's just, um, yeah, I mean, he's my idol. Mm. <laughs> and there's one thing I didn't say in the intro, which I should have, because it's so important to who you are, but Lauren's also a DJ. So on the side, really rising up, honestly, you are Lauren in the New Zealand yeah. music industry right now as a DJ and producer and already just sensing that it's such a big part of who you are as a person. Eh? Which yeah, is so cool. it is. I think it's um, becoming more and more a part of my identity and something that I no longer hide and um, I kind of think, yeah, it's a, it's a one package thing. Yeah. Why did you have to hide it? Yeah, I guess we can unpack that later, but I yeah. felt like venture capital or business um, and investments just really had nothing to do with music or DJing. Like, I just couldn't really see any synergy there or overlap. Um, But now, as I've kind of progressed in my career, there are actually quite a few similarities. um, And, yeah, I used to hide it because I thought people wouldn't find that relevant or take me maybe seriously. But um, interesting. now I'm not afraid to talk about it. And it's kind of like, this is who I am. So take it or leave it Mm. yeah nice yeah yeah it's interesting how many times we hear and I've done it myself you think you have to hide something yeah and and um that it's going to diminish your identity in the workplace which is Mm. just 
such a bizarre concept really yeah so true and now it's interesting being like internal into the ice house team um and seeing like you know when you have a song come out it's like you post on teens and we're like yeah. yes go lauren it's and different now and, yeah. and you're so yeah you're yeah. so um confident in sharing that side of you which i think has been cool to see from even when i started to where you are thank now, you so special yeah i think i've just gone to the point where I, if i think if i'm in my other world my music world if i'm promoting it like doing everything I can to get it out there you know co- contacting radio stations promoters mm-hmm. everything like why would I not just have everyone else in my network um, on the business side also know about it as well like why not post on LinkedIn why not tell an investor you never know where this might end up and um, that it has worked in my favour so mm-hmm. yeah that kind of yeah it was cool yes. lesson that I learned yeah and following from that would love you know this first question who is Lauren can you sort of unpack what that brings up for you introduce yourself and your career background and then what life looks like now yeah so I'm 26 years old I was born and raised in Auckland I have basically lived here my whole life and I define myself as a strong advocate for um, women in New Zealand Uh, businesswoman and then also uh, sort of overlapping into another male dominated industry which is music um, I see myself as an advocate uh, for women in both um, I'm very passionate about helping women raise capital um, grow their startups get support um, so that's basically something that I live and breathe and I love um, with my music it's very similar um, you know it's a very very male dominated industry the music industry in New Zealand um, even in particular the genre that I operate in, which is electronic music, um, you see less and less females. So my job is to thrive as much as I can, um, collaborate with other females in New Zealand um, and really give a voice um, yeah, to sort of both those worlds. Um, what else about me? I Yeah, I'm currently the Archangels Manager at Ice House Ventures. And what that means is that I'm currently raising the second fund um, that will invest in women in New Zealand. So it's the only fund, it's called the Archangels Fund, and it's the only fund in New Zealand of its kind that will exclusively invest in early stage uh, tech startups run by women. Yeah. Um, and I also manage a network, an angel network of about 45 uh, members who have the same mission. They only want to invest in women. So um, my role is very mission driven. Uh, it's all about supporting women also beyond investments. So I'm not just writing a check, but how can I emotionally uh, and mentally support them and be there for them. Um, yeah, that's that's kind of what I'm really passionate about. And then I guess on the side, yeah, I think I mentioned I love to surf, uh, play basketball, hang out with my dog on the weekends mm-hmm. um, and just find some chill time in between the uh, rather busy life that I live. The crazy. Mm-hmm. Where did that mission come from? Like where did that drive come from to, to help these women and... and um, Investment and also music. Like, was it something that you knew that you wanted to do as a as a kid, or was it like an aha moment somewhere along the line? I think it was something that developed organically over time, and it, now it's such an inherent or intrinsic part of the way I think or, or me that um, I'm, I'm, I almost think, when did I never not feel this way? Mm-hmm. Because I, this is what gets me out of bed every day. But um, yeah, there were definitely some times in my life where it was um, like there were catalysts. So one would be yeah, when I first entered the music industry, just really struggling as, as a solo um, artist. I still am a solo artist, but I felt really isolated to the point where there's, um, there were no other women to support me. The men that I did reach out to, um, you know, I had to be really careful about that and it didn't always end up sort of in the, in my favour. Um, you know, some, some had ulterior motives or it was just really hard to get up the ladder. Um, and a lot of people were trying to bring you down all the time, just unfortunately. Not so much anymore now, but six years ago, um, you saw a lot of that. So there was that aspect. Um, when it came to business, I ran my own e-commerce business um, in America. Um, I was very passionate about mental health and so there were mental health um, health supplements um, and there was a mental health brand around surrounded that. And yeah, like I was alone. Um, I was living in the US uh, running that business. Um, you know, obviously being, you know, ticking the boxes of being kind of like young, female, alone, uh, didn't have much support. And so I really felt that mm. burden, felt that uh, ongoing challenge. And it was just, 
yeah, the lack of support. I didn't really know what to do. It was more of like a, I don't know who to ask, where to go, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, those kind of moments in my life, I think, led me to a role like this where I'm helping women. And so when I first read this job description, it was, you know, exclusively, mm-hmm. um, there's a, you know, you're helping women, things like that. I thought, oh my gosh, like, this is a mission-driven role that's made for me, like I, and I have experiences that I can touch on. So it's like it was written for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally. it's, yeah, it's just I think now I have a level of empathy that means I can do my job really well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and if you hadn't had your own business maybe and in America, young women feeling those feelings that now, like you said, you know, allow you to have empathy for others... Um, maybe you wouldn't be in the position that you're in now. It's funny how little things line up. Like exactly. I, I couldn't agree more. I think that um, it tested me because I remember thinking, this isn't enjoyable. I'm not having fun. I'm running a business by myself. I have no idea what I'm doing. Mm. Like at university, we wouldn't get taught how to run a business mm. at like 23 years old mm. um, in a foreign country, knowing no one. So I remember thinking, you know, like, what's the point of this kind of thing? Or, you know, where am I even... I was, I was losing sort of... If you imagine, like, a battery full of, like, mm. bravery and courage, like, it was just getting kind of, um, you know, drained by the, mm. by the day um, to the point where I was like, I don't know if I can do this anymore. So, yeah, reading this job description or, you know, when I first heard about this role and I read about it, I thought, yeah, I've experienced probably most of these emotions or most of these challenges... Um, or elements of it that these um, other New Zealand startup founders um, are also experiencing. And if I can, you know, give back with a level of empathy um, and understanding, then that would be really amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow, that's so amazing. I know we're going off off pace. Yeah. But I just yeah. wanted to um, right. just wanted to ask one question, and that um, when for listeners that are feeling depleted and their battery is starting to run low and they can't see the wood for the trees. What is, like, how did you come out of that and what's your advice to people out there that are like, I just want to give up, I just mm-hmm. can't do this anymore? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So what kept me going um, was that I had to remind myself that there's, the, there's a purpose behind this. There's a reason why I'm struggling. It's not for no reason. It's not a waste of energy. Um, all the tears and all the late nights um, and all the calls to my family and friends back home, that wasn't a waste. At the time, I thought this is a waste. Like, this is so much energy going down the drain. Mm. Um, like I want, yeah, I wanted to give up at like, almost every day. I had, you know, that was like a 50 50 chance. Um, and now, and it's, I think it's something you can only really appreciate, like, two or three years later. And even people said, Lauren, you're not going to, not going to be able to see this now because you're, it's fresh, it's raw. This yeah. wound is very, very fresh, but you'll only be able to see it later. And, and I finally do see it now. But it's it's put you through um, a challenge and it tests you. And it does a, um, you know, the universe is testing you on purpose. Um, and that will lead to something more significant and more uh you know admirable later on in your life and so now two years on um mm. or three years on I should say I look back and think wow that that stint on my life first of all at the time it felt like it was dragging on like I was like wow I've wasted a year or I don't know what I'm doing um and and in reality actually that yeah has led me to be in a position where Maybe, maybe I may not have even got this job for a start. Um, so, you know, first of all, it just gave me that experience. Mm. Secondly, my mindset, my mentality and my outlook on life is very different now. Like, I don't take things for granted. Um, when there's a challenge in front of me, whether it's someone else's challenge or my challenge, I look at it as this is here to test us. It's not here to bring about failure or disaster. It's here to bring about something more positive and you may not see it immediately because it only happens later and it's almost like a subliminal thing and you just have to trust the process and if I knew that at the time then I'd maybe things would have been different you know maybe the business would have been a little bit different or my the day there'd be less tears or, or whatnot but I think I literally had to go through all those tears and all those roller coaster of emotions to finally come out the other side and appreciate those that one year living in Portland Oregon alone um <laughs> Again, something you can I can only do it almost like an 
out of body thing. It had to be later on. Um, exactly. And I, mm. it, it has sunk in now. Which is I really just, good. I had my first goosebump moment. Yeah. 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 It's amazing. Seriously. Yeah. Awesome insight. It's cool. Thank you. Um, oh, there's so many ways and places I could take this conversation. <laughs> like, it's just like, where do we go? But I want to ask this one because it gets people thinking. <laughs> what do people misunderstand about you the most, Lauren? So, obviously, yeah, you mentioned I am a music producer and DJ on the side, um, and that makes up um, as a huge part of my identity. I mean, I love it. I've been making music for three years, been DJing for six years, um, but I, a lot of people think that I'm, like, outside of work, I'm, like, this huge partier, and <laughs> because I'm a DJ, I like, all these late nights and big things on the weekend, but in reality... Um, I don't like do any of that. Like, um, first of all, I only play at festivals, which are they do not happen every weekend. They're very seasonal. They kind of happen only in summer, and um, they're kind of a one-off occasion thing. Um, and I kind of play my one-hour set and then you know chill out. So um, yeah, and I, I actually really love an early night. And I um, yeah, I'm pretty relaxed and don't have this like kind of big social massive life that people kind of make it out to sound because I think they assume oh because you're a DJ you must do XYZ when um, I'm probably more one of the uh, I'm a bit of a grandma you know after DJ set <laughs> so yeah and I, I wonder if yeah. that played into you not wanting to say hey this is it, oh, part of my life it definitely did yeah. I mean um and so, yeah, to add to that, um, one one investor who I didn't mention I was a DJ, but um, he we had a mutual friend, so he kind of knew that I was a DJ um, before meeting me. He, I found out later on after I pitched um, the first Archangel's Fund to him that he had asked uh, one of the directors in our company, he said, oh, you know, Lauren's, Lauren's raising this uh, this fund. Um, I know it's her day job and everything, but, you know, she's, she's got a target to reach of $2 million. Um, do you think she's going to get too distracted by her DJ? Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, I think that's a kind of a misconception about me. I'm like, wow. oh, first of all, like, first of all, DJing happens literally at night and on the weekend, so outside of work hours for, this, for a start. Mm-hmm. And also, I don't see how that would even impact my... Um, ability to do my you know to, to do my, my day job mm. um, so this was really interesting um and then it was quite funny when I when we exceeded the the goal of the fund I kind of sent this person a message being like hey like you know like um <laughs> he, 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 he invested. yeah I was like you know we got there like just wanted to let you know and like thanks for being a part of this and um <laughs> music's going well you know <laughs> just a nice little reminder that I can do both yeah. yeah isn't it interesting that you know someone that is incredibly focused and obviously you are very good at what you do Mm-hmm. including DJing. You can't be that good if you're out partying. Mm-hmm. And also, <laughs> yeah. it brings a whole other um, uh, element to and um, to your work as well. Yeah. Um, and it's just like meeting somebody who's got a life outside their work yeah. and also really good at it. That is yeah. so rare. Mm-hmm. So it's a very unique special thing Thank to you. have um, and I th- would say that it would bring a lot to your role at the Ice House mm. and yeah 100% mm. high capacity yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely I, I, I hope so I think um, how my boss Robbie Paul described it he said you know seeing if you if you see if you ever come to one of my sets I'm very energetic like I'm jumping around like mm-hmm. you have some DJs that just stand behind the decks I'm like jumping around and hyping up the crowd oh, I want to come watch <laughs> you um, and so I'm quite an energetic uh, you know um, quite high adrenaline person and so um, I like to think that I bring that high energy um, and good vibes and creativity Definitely. to work mm. as well because mm. you've got to have an open mind with everything music work whatnot and, and to have that left left brain and right brain as well you know you've mm. obviously got a very analytical left brain and then that creative right brain I mean that is like magic right there mm. it's awesome it is yeah it's so cool I just want to dive a bit deeper into this um into what you do at ISIS Ventures yeah. and your mission to help female founders mm. access funding in New Zealand. It's massive. What has that journey been like for you so far and what have you learned from this time? Yeah, I, lo- I love this question. It's been, it's been an amazing journey. I mean, first of all, I'm so blessed and grateful to be given this responsibility. Um, 
you know, it's mm. it, I feel fulfilled and I feel uh, very, you know, enriched that I can, knowing that I'm helping and supporting women in New Zealand. However, what does come with that is um, almost, like, I feel frustrated. I also feel, um, you know, disappointed at mm. the numbers and... Um, with the conversations I'm having with women. So, you know, as I uh, uncover um, more pieces of the of the industry and what it does for women, um, mm-hmm. perhaps not doing enough, uh, you know, it brings about, yeah, like I said, I, I guess a frustrated nature. So um, the journey has been very, you know, it's been amazing in the sense that I've, knowing that I've helped females directly, um, they come to me and they're very grateful. Um, I can provide... Mm-hmm we can provide emotional support, um, mentorship advisory, but at the same time, I'm also seeing um, those challenges aren't really going away. So, um, you know, women still find it really hard to access capital. Three percent of all venture capital funding globally went to women last year. So, three percent. Yeah, three percent. We're not even in double digits. And so, for me, it's almost like I love what I do, but the problem is bigger than just an individual working and. In, ISAS Ventures trying to solve it so I, I'm almost like alright like I'm racking through my brain every day like what what can I do that's more impactful it's materially larger you know I've, we, we do have an amazing community and I'll talk about that a bit later you know some incredible individuals in New Zealand who are fostering the, uh, the support but just we just have so much more work to do like um, you know 18% of angel investment went to women in New Zealand in 2018. That's the most recent uh, statistic I have. Mm. Um, again, it's just not enough. Like, we, we see, we're we seeing male founded ventures uh, being funded uh, significantly more, and my job is to bring equality and balance and diversity, and I think that we're doing a great job, but it's there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Why is that dial not moving? Yeah. Like, after... I mean, we're in 2022. Mm. 2022. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> Why? What's going on? Yeah, we're we're well educated. we 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 know this stuff. We know that women are freaking unbelievable in business. Why? Why is this dial not moving? Well, I'll touch on you. Yeah, I mean, you touch on education, and mm. that's actually one of the reasons that I think we're. Um, why it's not moving. I think we're lacking a bit in education, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Um, there needs, like, these numbers, um, some people aren't yet aware of them, you know, some no. people just think, oh, you know, like, they see, they they, they, you know, they might see a, a great, they might see on the news, you know, like a, a woman founded venture doing well and then just might think, oh, great, you know, they're, they're having a, they're having a great time, like, they, they got to their, they got to that revenue point, um, easily or you know they might just make some assumptions but you know beneath that there's um a lot of hard work like women have to work twice as hard um so you know the, you, first of all you've got sort of general misogyny that just exists and biases and stereotypes so um that doesn't work in the favor of a woman and then you have um arguably what's for me this is probably one of the most important um challenges that not everyone's aware of and what's that's called unconscious bias and so um there were some studies done overseas uh, where they looked at uh, female led ventures uh, raising money in comparison to male led ventures, and basically unconscious bias showed um, that it existed. And what that was was that uh, women, when pitching for investment to VCs, they were asked prevention questions such as um, what will you do in the event of failure for your startup? So really restrictive, negative questions, basically not allowing them to um, mm. talk mm. about their startup or say anything positive. And then they compared it to a sample of um, either their male co-founders or just fully run um, businesses by men. And they were asked uh, promotional questions. So very positive and uplifting, such as um, how will you scale your business in five to 10 years time? So yeah. basically giving mm. men the opportunity to talk up their business and, and their pitch and, themselves. Mm. and the result of this uh, of unconscious bias was that in the end um, women were from, from the study women were funded less like they received less funding and they um, but I think they went on to still do okay but it was just showing that you know when you don't have the opportunity to even talk positively about your business you've never even had that chance to begin with um, how will you ever get ahead how will you ever get that 
kick start mm-hmm. and everyone should have an equal start or an equal um, footing on the ground but it's like unequal from day one so that's really messed up and so um, and unconscious bias exists here like you know I talked to a lot of um, women founders in New Zealand um, you know from all ages and they they have experienced the exact same thing you know they've given me examples of questions um, you know I've there's, th- there's things like, oh, you know, you'd have a better shot at raising money if you were single or maybe don't mention that you're a mum and you have kids. Um, you know, some really shocking things mm-hmm. or, like, um, you're, in, you're, in the, you're in the big boys club, that kind of thing. Just some, you know, things that are really unacceptable. Mm-hmm. Um, and, yeah, so that is why there's such this challenging landscape. And so the education and awareness piece is really important. So circling back to that, um, people need to know that unconscious bias exists so that if they're an investor, that they can, you know, just be aware that they're framing their questions um, in a balanced way. I mean, in the study, it showed that women VCs were actually asking it to women as well, women mm. to women. Like, it's, that's why I guess it's a, it's a bias, yeah. right? Um, and so, you know, it's important that founders know how to flip a prevention question. Um, <laughs> you know, yeah, people just know about this. Yeah, so that when you go into a pitch, you're like, you're ready and you're, and, and on people, on both sides, you really, you know, investors are not asking these types of questions. They're framing them equally, you know, whether it's a man or a woman in front of them. And then as a founder, you know, how to, how to, yeah, flip it, avoid it and pivot that question to something more positive. And is that what you do? You train I, I don't it's not part of my role to, to train yeah. people uh, to, to do unconscious bias training yeah. um, I think it's something I'd love to do later on mm. because our team we're all aware of it that's, that's a good thing yeah. I think we um, I don't think any of us ask um, these question, prevention questions and mm. we, we know that it exists so therefore um, we you know give everyone an equal opportunity to pitch and um, yeah. you know the conversations are balanced uh, and whatnot. but I know that it still, I guess, goes on in the industry, and it's people are still experiencing it. So um, that's a that's a one big hurdle, I suppose. Yeah, and it really knocks down the confidence of a founder, right? Because you kind of walk away from a pitch thinking, "Oh, well, that didn't go so well. Like, what did I do wrong?" And it's like, "Well, actually, nothing. You didn't do anything mm-hmm. wrong. Mm-hmm. You were just asked really tricky questions. You had to navigate around, mm-hmm. and of course, your answers aren't going to be as." eloquent as if they were just straightforward and positive Mm. it's amazing how language can just be so powerful yet so detrimental just the use of words turning Mm. them into a positive or a negative yes um super interesting yeah and that idea of the skill of flipping the questions that blew my mind like you know, like that's something that, you know, female founders need to be geared up with and, and knowledgeable about going into these bears. They definitely do. Yeah. And that's why, yeah, I mean, I sound like a broken record, it's like education and awareness, mm-hmm. but it is really important um, mm-hmm. for, yeah, both the investors and both the founders, so for everyone in the industry so that they are well-versed um, to create equality because I think that's that's the first step if we're, if we're going to actually move the dial um see proper changes then we've got to be talking differently behaving differently um that's in the favor of women Mm. um so that women are brought up to the same level that that men are that their male counterparts are in a in a pretty solid position um they don't face the same challenges that women do and so it's just about bringing them up to that equal uh level and giving them that same voice i Mm. suppose and it seems so simple like when you when you when you break it down like that, it seems so simple, but it's such a gargantuan mm. task yeah. that as a collective we all need to be doing this. Definitely, that's why the community behind um, helping women in New Zealand is really important because I'm just one person. I'm I'm one advocate. I'm one supporter, and that's great. And I can spread the word as much as I can. But um, you know, I, I am just an individual, and so when you corral a bunch of people Mm -hmm. um and there are some amazing women out there who love backing other women it's um you know you you have this amazing sort of um you know like cycle and 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 it's uh, these conversations going and that's really good but it's important that we um like yes like i guess foster that and we keep that safe and um grow that as well because there's only going to be more budding female entrepreneurs mm-hmm. coming out of 
uni or high school we want to enter and we, we want to make the space equal for them so it's just important to yeah I guess grow that and um, yeah keep it sacred and yeah. whatnot. When I did um, research for this conversation I was messaging Lauren because I was finding out all these stats like the 3% um, stat and and I was, I was literally messaging you, I've just been like, I'm so proud of you, but also I'm feeling all these emotions of anger and disappointment and, but wow, I'm so proud of the work you're doing, but man, like, what can we do? And yeah, it's totally, so yeah, it's interesting. Like I've I only feel. heard that and yeah. I've been, I've been banging about for decades and yeah. I've only heard that stat, well, not, yeah. like before, yeah. before we met you, mm. a couple of weeks before. Mm. Exactly. And it's insane. Yeah, so if we can just spread that. And yes. About it, then that's powerful that, that's stuff. That's powerful. But another one that blew my mind was that female-led organisations are 35% more, where is it? Do, 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 do. The stats show that women are 35% more capital efficient. Yes. That also blew my mind because it's like, okay, cool, so they're getting less, but then when they do get the opportunity, they're actually more efficient with the capital as Correct. well. Could you unpack, you know, what that means and then, you know, educate us on the benefits of actually investing in women-led startups? Mm. Yeah. So exactly, like, behind this, it's just so ironic or mm. unfair, um, even more because despite getting funded less, women are actually doing more with their money. So, um, again, um, more, more studies show that women are better with their spending, um, they provide better returns, they, uh, you know, they just have a better use of their funds, you know, after a capital raise. Um, and so even though they are literally funded less by kind of everyone in the world, mm-hmm. um, and so they are returning more for, for their dollar, um, and, you know, as an investor, this is very um, appealing, and it's a very, um, you know, yeah, the, the, you, it's, still, it's still risky, startup investing. Like I'll, I'll just like emphasise that um, you're never, there's no guarantee in what you'll see in yeah. a male or female-led company. Um, but yeah, when you pull up these stats about women um, doing really well, it's, it's almost like it's a no-brainer to invest in them. Mm-hmm. And often when I'm pitching the Archangels Fund to investors, I say, look, don't just invest from an emotional standpoint like economically this mm. makes sense like mm. look at look at some of the world's most amazing um female billionaires i mean they have worked their way to get to this point and um they're just fantastic and it's like you would definitely invest in them wouldn't you so why not do why not do it here like in new zealand we're very capable of um you know producing some exceptional uh female billionaires and so yeah as an investor it's um it's it looks like it's, it would be framed as a great return for them um you know have faith because these people are aspirational heroes like I, I do believe that women you know are our future and they are the world leaders um for business and in many other areas as well and it just it's a, yeah it makes sense to to back um such an amazing group of people mm. well, why do you think women are more efficient with their capital I think that women, you know, they're they're the world's um, empathetic and emotional, intelligent leaders that you know bring about so much um, positivity and energy. And I think that you know women look at things a little bit differently. I think you know, yeah, with capital and with spending. Um, their decision making it's it's just a little bit different I think that they um, they're still risk, they're, they're risk takers and they're ambitious but I think they're also very sensible and they're very um, mm-hmm. pragmatic and so they just know how to you know spend money well um, when to spend it when not to spend it um, and you know just produce these incredible results mm-hmm. and that becomes you know from an investment standpoint that looks really good and we should be investing in more types of people like that because then we'll just see better returns and um, yeah, then you've got sort of a thriving, booming startup industry. Mm, nice. Yeah, so interesting. And what I get from Al, or just from knowing you, is you really are a voice. Uh, you stand up for a lot of women-led uh, founders, um, people. I think you've won an award for that, eh? You're like a LinkedIn top <laughs> voice or something, which is quite cool. Um, yeah, <laughs> I, um, I do a bit of... Uh, 
uh, blog writing, I suppose. When I say a bit, I've only written like less than 10 blogs. But um, it's, yeah, usually my, my uh, stories are around um, profiling um, either like a, a famous um, uh, world, a global leader. So I, re- I did um, Whitney Wolf Heard, who's the CEO and founder of Bumble and also the youngest uh, female billionaire mm-hmm. in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, she and is... She's amazing. She's incredible. Yeah. yeah. She's yeah. just an icon for everyone. Yeah. And yeah. then I also, all the way down to interviewing um, Fia Jones, who's um, an Auckland-based uh, 22-year-old uh, female founder who uh, runs her company, Asterix Astronautics, and they make uh, small, um, they make power systems for small satellites in space. And so she's incredible. currently... I've met this girl. Yeah. yeah. So she's, she's just... Um, <laughs> A force of nature, and so, yeah. Um, but for that, for me, that's such incredible examples of you championing and, and giving these people a seat at the table. Um, following from that, have you ever felt uh, like you haven't had a seat at the table? And in these moments, what do you do to overcome this? Because you're actually sitting in these pitch meetings, talking to investors, fighting for these women-led. You know, have you had any moments where you're like, "Oh, I don't feel like I have a seat at this table"? At the beginning, when I first started this job almost two years ago I definitely felt like at times my voice was a bit suppressed like I um I like to think of myself as quite a vocal confident person and that if I have a message or or a mission to um, convey like I will do it with zero inhibitions however yes there's definitely times where that's been a struggle Um, when I was trying to network and meet other people um kind of like me so entry level kind of just just entering the, the venture capital startup world, um, I kind of struggled to find other mm-hmm. women leaders and that I felt kind of comfortable opening up to um, and, yeah, getting their support. And anyway, that was when I started. Now it's a lot better. Like, I'm yeah. seeing a lot more balance um, and diversity in the in the space, which is very, very important. And it's, and it's important that we, we keep that and we maintain and grow into that direction of diversity um so right now I feel like my voice isn't um prevented in any way and I don't think anyone can really stop me from what I'm trying to um you know convey whether yeah it's on LinkedIn or whether it's in person with an investor um you know we may disagree and it's fine um how did you get to that stage Mm -hmm. like what was the um what was the transition point and how did you get I think I just realised that because I'm so, so passionate about helping New Zealand uh, female entrepreneurs and I want them to succeed um, and grow their businesses into billion dollar companies and I want them to be happy and thriving, um, that was just a natural mm. move for me. Like I thought, I've got to give it my all. I can't just give it my 70% or if I'm in a room with someone who might have opposing views I'm not just going to kind of walk away or leave that because I have a duty to fulfill and that duty is to change people's opinions um, bring about awareness or educate them I mean they they may think a certain way about women or um, or maybe they just don't know enough to form their own opinions and so I have a duty to help them form a, a good judgment and I'm not going to force someone to sort of like you know, change their own opinion or think a certain way. But what I can do is enlighten them with information, um, engage them in the right way, and it's up to, it's up to them to then go on and, and you know act accordingly and you know um, support or not support yeah. women. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a seat at the table is not about arrogance, mm-hmm. is it? No. And and um, and that's what I'm getting. I've just sort of like had an epiphany that a lot of people would think they've had got a right to have a seat at the table, and that errs on that arrogant side. Um, whereas we come at it in from another angle, and it's that humbleness, yet confidence mm. to have that seat and that voice. Right. Hey, yeah. No, agree? I, I agree, and it's a. I think it's a hard balance to strike because yes. mm. you know like it is, yeah. it's the whole like oh wow she's a pretty vocal person like wow she's really opinionated and I don't really want that you know um, but hey I mean if it's going to get a message across and it's going Brilliant. to um, uh, yeah it's going to execute on some 
some actions and I'm, I'm actually kind of fine with that because I'd rather see change happen than nothing definitely at all. I'd rather I'd rather like be loud and sort of proud and see see something come about than had not, not have tried in the first place but I agree there is it's hard to strike a balance of sort of being yeah I guess quietly confident and humble uh, but also trying to get your message across in quite a strong um impactful way yeah yeah totally oh it's so good I'd love to hear like what does success look like for you then in terms of when it comes to women-led funding and startups what are you striving for Success would be when we no longer need a fund that exclusively invests in women. When wow. there's just, yeah, yeah mm-hmm. when or when he, you don't see headlines saying female founder raises X amount, like that should be a headline mm-hmm. um, <laughs> because equality would be when you know everyone's raising and um, founder and raises ex- exactly, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. and that there's funds designed for um, literally everyone in the in the industry, and so. Um, yeah, success is when we don't need a specific mechanism for that. Um, success is also when unconscious bias doesn't exist. Um, you know, these challenges that women face when trying to raise capital disappear mm. and that the landscape is more diverse and equal. Mm. Amazing. So it's a listener. So it puts me out of a job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking that, but I was like, no, there's so many things. <laughs> yeah. There's a ways to go. Yeah. I'll just, yeah. We'll, we'll, keep, we'll keep thriving. Hopefully, yeah. you're not here when you're 98. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, as listeners, you know, like I was researching and going, oh, I'm so like, you know, proud of you, but frustrated by the landscape that we're in. What can I do? Um, what I know we've talked about the education piece and that, but maybe unpack practically what can yeah. listeners do, men, women, you know, like what can we do to help? Definitely. So mm. the first thing would be like, I, it's really important to meet other like minded people who are really aligned to this mission. So, you know, if you're a founder and you're looking to raise money for your business, um, you know, there's incredible, there's, we've got Archangels, which is, you know, we're a great mission driven um, uh, network and um, we welcome, you know, conversations with pretty much anyone. Um, but there's also, you know, Teresa Gatting out there who gives a lot of her energy and time um, and resources into helping women. The CEO, which she runs, um, there's, your Sam Wong from Blackbird so there's other yeah. incredible women in this industry who would be happy to have a conversation um, with yeah, I guess any sort of entrepreneur or, or budding entrepreneur um, so I think yeah like practically like try and connect and network and meet as many people mm-hmm. as possible um, they will often point you in the right direction uh, that way you won't feel as alone or um, isolated on this journey which um, often can be something when you you know as, as a woman because it's um, you know there's just a lot of men around and you feel a little bit um, yeah, lonely in that sense so I think meeting, meeting the right people and knowing that there is a community of women out there supporting you would be my first thing um, uh, the second thing would be you know yeah just um, you know if you if you want to really be involved I mean you can like read up about these funds that like you know the Archangels Fund the Archangels Network like our mission why we exist um, that's really important Um, that's a way of basically just like telling people like there's a need for us like there's there's a gap and um, there's a need and we're addressing it and so um, you know come along to a pitch night and you'll see what that's like and you'll see why you'll you'll be invigorated when you walk into a room full of investors that um, you know they're ex entrepreneurs themselves. They come from a diverse uh, range of like backgrounds and skill sets, and it's just like a really um, engaging, like powerful kind of like energetic room to be in. So yeah, there's things you can do, and there's people you can talk to. Question for a friend: Do you have to be a gazillionaire to no, be? No, no, absolutely question. not. I mean, I'm. I personally want to invest in this fund that I'm raising, but I don't have don't have the funds personally. Um, but you know, you can you can be involved in other ways. So, um, and that that does, that has no dollar value on that. So you know, there's mentorship, there's advisory. Um, yeah, giving back your time. So yeah, that was the other one I should touch on is um, 
a lot of these women, you know, a one hundred thousand dollar check is fantastic, but they need to know what to do with it, or they might need, you know, there there are some tough days where they just need someone to talk to, um, and so if you can be a mentor to them, um, provide advice. Um, give up a bit of your time just to, um, you know, help with providing a bit of direction. You know, the problem could range from, like, I just don't know what to do with, with my team or, or, I feel, or I just feel really stressed out, you know, or, I'm, you know, I've, I've got this product, how do I market it? It could literally just be a whole range of things. But um, that also, yeah, that emotional mental support mm. is a really, really important element that also plays into it. Very cool. Mm, I hadn't thought about yeah. it like that. Yeah. If this conversation sparks a fire in a collective group around New Zealand and the world to get more involved, to be, um, a, a, to, to have a support or create a support network mm. um, that moves that dial, then bring yeah. it on. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I'm after this, I'll be putting my hand up mm. and I'll be contacting you 100%. <laughs> That's so cool. I love that. Yeah. I love, I love the, the passion and what you're saying. I can hear it in your voice. I can tell oh. that you are, you are moved and it's, um, it's amazing, like, meeting my, my job. I feel so lucky to meet people like you who, who feel invigorated and, mm. um, you know, want to, to change things as well. So, um, you know, just if we have more people like that then it's like we've, we've got a movement we've got yeah. a community and um, that's when that, that dial starts to really snowball move. effect mm-hmm. yeah. let's go yeah. honestly Lauren I have like five other questions I'd like to ask but I feel like you have so brilliantly articulated just the passion and the importance of the subject and so like I said there's so many angles we could have taken it but you've touched on it all so so brilliantly thank um, you Brian so really thank you that. so much for being on a seat at the table it's my pleasure thank you for giving me a seat at the table mm-hmm. and giving me a platform um, and a voice obviously there are a lot of themes that we talked about today about um, spreading the word getting people uh, on board and you know this is just one of many ways and so I'm incredibly grateful for that and I hope that anyone who listens to this feels motivated and inspired um, just in the same way that we all do so cool Thank you. You should see the smiles on our faces.